Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture on electricity and magnetism. And by the time that we get through with this lecture, I'd like for you to basically find out that electricity and magnetism are almost one and the same thing. They're just two different aspects of one force, the electromagnetic force. Um, I've also posted on our website, our Canvas website, a really, really interesting lecture by Walter Lewin. I believe that's how you say his name. He's a Dutch astrophysicist, but for a very long time he was a lecturer at MIT. And his lectures are very famous for taking, you know, things as complicated as physics and making them really fun to learn about and to watch. And so this lecture is a full-length lecture, 40-plus minutes, um, but during the lecture, he takes something that's pretty complicated um, and, and just has a lot of fun with it. And he also does these really, really cool um, experiments right as he's lecturing. And so his lecture style is just awesome, and I really do uh, hope that you uh, watch it. At about the 30-minute point, he starts to derive some uh, equations. And you could, uh, you don't have to pay attention to those equations. It's not something that I need for you to understand in this class. Um, you may want to continue watching to the end because at the end he does one more final experiment, uh, and it's just, it's hilarious. So um, give it your best shot. Watch that after you watch this lecture, and uh, let me know if you liked it. So when we talked about last time Newton's laws. And we talked about his first law of motion, is that an object is not going to change its motion unless it's acted on by some sort of unbalanced force. And the other way to say that is, is if an object is at rest, it will stay at rest, and if an object is in motion, it will remain in motion until something stops it. And of course, objects that have a greater mass have more inertia, which just means that it will take more force to change their motion. And that is really good to describe a number of things, but it's not it's not going to be useful uh, when we talk about other forces. And what we're going to talk about is electrical and magnetic forces. So, <laughs> for example, we talked about how things uh, fall uh, due to gravity, but why does a magnet stick on your refrigerator? and not fall just straight to the ground. So these, this electrical charge uh, has to be stronger than gravity, which is pretty incredible. And as humans, we've been familiar with ele electromagnetic, uh, at least magnetic and electrical charges um, for a very, very long time. The, the ancient Greeks would observe things uh, could be uh, attracted or repelled by being charged. Uh, famously, women would take fur and rub it on amber, and it would cause their hair to move and things like that. And so um, we, we, they, they, we were never sure why these things would happen, um, but it, it, it led to many fascinations. Um, electricity is a force that moves objects toward and away from each other. But static electricity is this electrical charge that can be put onto objects, but doesn't move them, hence it's static. Uh, and so, so that's what static electricity means. It's an electrical charge that doesn't move once it's been placed on an object. And like I said, that electrical force is vastly more powerful than gravity. It moves things uh, due to its own self, not by gravity. So before we... Um, get too much further into this, I'd like to talk about, to you about an atom. Now, everything in life is made up of atoms. Um, and an atom uh, has a nucleus, okay, and the nucleus is, is much smaller than the entirety of the molecule. Um, and a molecule may be made up of many atoms. Um, but in a molecule, in the, in the, sorry, in an atom, the nucleus of the atom contains two types of, uh, of subunits protons and neutrons. Now, protons and neutrons are basically the same mass. It's this very, very small mass. Um, and, but they have different charges. 
protons are said to have a positive charge, whereas neutrons are said to have a neutral, hence being neutrons, or neither a positive or a negative charge. And so if you, if you take a positive charge and compare it to no charge, we say that the, the nucleus of the atom is overall positively charged. On the outsides flying around, sorry, flying around these uh, atoms, flying around the nucleus, are these electrons. And electrons fly in what are called orbitals. Basically, they orbit the uh, nucleus. And electrons are much, much less massive than uh, protons and neutrons. In fact, it's pretty much negligible. So when we talk about where is all of the mass in an atom, it's in the nucleus. The electrons are just, just very, very, very tiny. But they do contain a charge, and it's a negative charge. And the negative charge is exactly comparable to the positive charge of a proton. Hence that if you have three protons and three electrons, the overall charge of that atom is neutral. Okay. Now, if you were to somehow lose an electron, you would then have three positive charges, protons, two negative charges, electrons, and therefore the atom would be something that is called a cation. And a cation is just an ion. An ion is uh, a molecule that has a charge. And a cation, it means it has a positive charge. If I were to gain an electron, be given an electron from some other thing, I would then have more negative charges than positive charges, and I would be considered an anion. Okay, and so an anion is just an ion or a, uh, an atom that has more negative charges. Okay, so that is basically uh, a lot to do with static electricity, where charges can be given to a molecule or lost. There are, of course, two kinds of electrical charges where like repels like and like uh, attracts opposite. So if these two metal spheres, one was positive and one was negative, the opposite charges would attract and positive, two positive or two negative charges would repel each other. So the early scientists that were interested in this electrical charge um, were called electricians, uh, believe it or not. That's what they called themselves. And Benjamin Franklin was actually, the mo well, obviously, clearly one of the most famous North American electricians. And he was able to kind of come up with the idea that electricity could have a positive charge or a negative charge. And he sort of viewed electricity as a liquid, and he called it like the, the electrical liquid. And basically what he meant by that was you, you could make it flow. And that's true. You can make electricity flow. And what he would say is you could, you could basically take charges from one, and if you took it, then it would be um, negative, and if you put it on the other, it would be positive. And he did a lot of these experiments, but really what's most important and what's true is that he came up with the idea that there could be positive charges and negative charges. He did a number of experiments with electricity, including uh, his famous kite experiment during a thunderstorm. Uh, he clear, very clearly could have died from this as an um, electric shock lightning hit this and came down and would have, would have certainly shocked him. Uh, but he was lucky to remain alive. He also invented um, lightning rods that he uh, would then uh, basically uh, tell the world about and that many towns still use to this day. A lightning rod is just a large metal rod that sticks high above um, buildings so that instead of hitting wood surfaces and causing fires in towns, it w the lightning would strike the metal rod instead. And so just pretty interesting that this is how science began. You have definitely uh, witnessed, uh, especially if you have very, very long hair, um, or even uh, if you have short hair, if you've combed, uh, put a comb through your hair and felt that, you know, for lack of a better word, staticky uh, popping noise, um, that is actually electrons being removed from your hair and added to the comb. And so that is the static electricity where a charge is moving from one object, the hair, to another object, the comb. And a lot of times this happens during very dry days, during the winter especially. 
Okay, so that's electricity. Let's talk a bit about magnetism. Mag magnetism, or the magnetic force, was discovered by William Gilbert. Um, William Gilbert was very famous for being uh, the Queen of England's um, physician. But what he's probably uh, even more renowned for is his ability to describe magnets as having two opposite poles, a north and a south pole. And it's very true. And he was able to show through a number of different experiments about that magnets had north and south poles. He was also able to show that the nor two north poles would repel each other and a north and a south pole would go together. And this is where I'm trying to show you that magnetism and electricity are very, very similar in those things. Just like you can show an electric field, you can also show a magnetic field. And so we know that we uh, can see things um, like the, the Earth itself having two poles, a north and a south pole, and there's a magnetic field of the Earth. And that can be shown by looking at a compass where the needle will point towards the northern magnetic pole and away from the southern magnetic pole. And if you bring um, strong, if you bring magnets closer to this compass, it will screw up this needle um, and, and, and show that a magnetic field can be interfered with. Um, but you can also show it by this is what theoretically a, a magnetic field would look like as the north and south charges are attracted from each other and they move away. But here is an actual north and south uh, magnet, the poles and these iron fillings actually showing this in motion. So that's basically in real life what this drawing is. And the magnetic, uh, the magnetic field is being shown by these uh, shavings. So really, really cool. Aurora Borealis um, is actually a phenomenon that happens in the sky when Earth's magnetic field interacts with particles that come from the sun. And so you get these really bright lights. Um, and it's just a, another example of seeing magnetic fields. Science has also been able to show that organisms are able to utilize Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Something as simple as um, the magnetic uh, navigation from iron mineral, minerals, see right here, in this bacterium, that they react with the Earth's magnetic field and let them know which way's up and which way's down. But birds have been shown to do this, and um, many other organisms have been shown to be able to understand and, and interact with the magnetic field of Earth. What's interesting is that if you were to split a magnet in two, you wouldn't get in one hand a northern uh, pole only and in the other hand a southern pole only, but you would then in, in fact get two poles, two new magnets. And this would just continue happening every time you split down the middle, down and on and on into in, you know, infinity until you couldn't split them anymore. Um, you would get two, two poles. You would never get isolated uh, magnetic poles. So that's just an interesting thing about magnets to think about. The last thing I'd like to talk about are batteries and electric circuits. So somebody, uh, an a Italian named Luigi Galvani, uh, was able to show um, that electricity would be able to make frog muscles contract. And um, so basically uh, he was able to apply an electric current and the frog's legs would, would jump up and down. And that is because in order to move these muscles, you have nerve cells that can transmit actually electrical signals. That's how your, your nerves and, and moving muscles works, by sending and transmitting chemical and electrical signals. Um, and so basically he was just starting to figure out that, um, that electricity could cause this. Now this uh, led him down a path that is, not, is, is known not to be true where he, he described some sort of like animalistic electricity that separated animals from inanimate objects. Um, that, that is not the case, obviously, um, that there's no like innate um, thing, like an, an animalistic innate thing that moves uh, your muscles. It is just quite simply chemical, electrochemical signals being transmitted down a wire for lack of a better term, uh, basically your nerves. And so I'll show that in a second. Um, this led to some pretty barbaric things um, where uh, not Galvani, but other um, 
I don't even want to call them scientists, but sort of uh, stage performances would happen with cadavers where electric, electric currents would be applied to fresh cadavers, and those cadavers would, of course, uh, be able to move. And it actually inspired the, the writings of Frankenstein. Um, so it basically, Volta's work, coupled with what he learned from the galvanic reactions, uh, which were basically batteries, um, he were published, and then there was tra traveling road shows where uh, they would take uh, fresh human cadavers and have them sit up and move their legs and arms. Not science at all, of course, more like d weird carnival uh, presentations, but those demonstrations inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein. Uh, so kind of interesting. And the last thing is ba these batteries and electrical current. So the electrical current is quite literally this flow of charged particles. And batteries were made by somebody named Alessandro Volta. That Volt is, is a pretty good uh, way to remember that. Um, and he was able to make a, a battery, which is something that converts stored chemical energy to kinetic energy, energy. So it still works where we have this stored potential chemical energy that's being able to be changed in form into kinetic energy or the energy that does work. Um, and that leads us to electric circuits. An electric circuit is an unbroken path of material that can carry electricity, that flowing electrical particles, throughout the circuit. The material uh, that carries this is known as an electrical conductor. And a circuit consists of three parts. The source of the energy, perhaps the battery. The closed path, usually made of metal wire, and just so that the, the current can flow through it. And then a device that's going to be powered. Uh, a motor, a light bulb, uh, for instance. And um, here is what a very, very simple electrical circuit would look like. So here um, are the positive parts of the battery. The negative is on the other side. And basically what happens is there is the path that the electrical current can take and power the bulb and then move back through and it's a circuit and it just goes on and on like this, continuing to power the light bulb. Um, Ohm's law, basically, Ohm's law, a scientist named Ohm, he comes up with this relationship between the resistance in a circuit, the current that flows, and the voltage, which is Ohm's law. So it comes with these, these terms that you should, you should define. An ampere, it measures the amount of current, or the, basically the number of electrons that flows in a wire. Voltage is the amount of electrical pressure in a circuit. And then electrical resistance measures how hard it is to push electrons through the wires. And an ohm is how you describe electrical resistance. It's the unit of electrical resistance. So that's Ohm's law. So we see things like lightning strikes happening all the time, um, where the negative particles that are, are circulating in the atmosphere get attracted to positive particles on the ground. They shoot up to meet each other, and that's how lightning strikes happen. Here are some more terms relating to electric currents. Um, voltage, uh, the unit volt, it's like if you were to describe electrical pressure, it would be like water pressure. Resistance in ohms, it's like how large the diameter of the pipe is. Um, the current, flow rate of electrons, it's like the flow rate, basically the current of the water as well. Power is current times the voltage, and that's measured in watts. And it's basically like the rate of work done by moving water, like perhaps water moving a propeller, right? So just some terms to be familiar with, Not nothing like I would, you know, really want to test you on, um, but just things to start getting familiar with. Um, so here is uh, what I was talking about before on how you can basically uh, send signals from your brain into your hand to grab something, right? Uh, or do anything for, for that matter where you are able to propagate signals along um, your nerves. And basically, here is what a, a nerve cell looks like, where these dendrites hang off of the cell body, and they're basically uh, able to pick up chemical signals and turn them into electrical signals, and then send them down the axon, okay? This myelin sheath is just there to, to protect 
this axon and basically help the, the, the message be sent down this axon until they get to the axon terminal where the axon terminal sends through maybe to another uh, nerve cell uh, that we call um, basically sending one message from one nerve to another nerve. Uh, we, we call that propagation of a signal. And basically that is how you can pass signals uh, down from your brain to your arm and then your, you know, what in, in the opposite way. If you pick up something and it's too hot, it sends a signal back through your nerves to say, oh, I'm going to move my hand or something like that. So these are electrical signals and electrochemical signals because you can change uh, electric to chemical. But anyway, that's just something to, to, be, to, to be interested in. The next thing um, and the last thing I'd like to talk about is there are two kinds of electric circuit, a series circuit versus a parallel circuit. Um, so, so my question is, why is your house going to be wired with parallel circuits? And so let's take a look. Well, first of all, here's what a series circuit is. It's the battery that's going to power it, the wire that can send this flow of electrons through and basically three light bulbs that get to light. So here's a series circuit. Now here's a parallel circuit where there's one loop that powers this light and another loop that powers this light. So why do you think your house is, is filled with a bunch of loops like this? Well, the, the easiest way to visualize this is if you've ever seen really old Christmas lights and compared them to new Christmas lights. In old Christmas lights, they're made with series circuits where each Christmas light is attached to the next on the same wire. And what happens is if one of these bulbs goes out, boom, boom, all of the other bulbs go out. And so uh, you can imagine that you don't want to get rid of uh, all your lights and it's a pain in the butt to go and change each light out to see which one is the broken one. And so instead what you can do is have a parallel circuit where if loop one's light goes out, loop two's light will stay on. And so if you were in your room and a lamp light went out, you wouldn't want your fan to go off and your charger to stop and all these other things. So that's why you'd like a parallel circuit. Just thought that'd be interesting to talk about. So with that, I'm going to leave you here. I've got one other lecture coming up talking about waves. And so look for that one and I will see you in the next one.